Hi, I'm Marty Kelsey, and we are coming to you live from the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., and we have a great program for you today. We're going to be joined in just a couple of minutes by two astronauts, Joe Acaba and Mark Vandai, who just got back from six months on the International Space Station, where they did a ton of amazing science. We want you to participate today. Go to Facebook Live, go down to the comments section, let us know where you're watching from, and if you've got a question for Mark or Joe, just put it in the comments section. We've got some students with us today from Hyattsville Middle School. Welcome, guys. And here in just a few minutes, you guys are going to get an opportunity to ask astronauts questions. You'll just head over to the microphone when we get to that section of the show. We're really excited about this. You're watching What's New in Aerospace. Let's welcome Mark Vandehei and Joe Acaba. Give them a big round of applause. Welcome, guys. Thank you guys so much for coming in today. Hey, well, we want to thank you for inviting us. So we'd like to present you with this uh, for the National Air and Space Museum. So we have a montage of our flight. Uh, we appreciate you bringing us out here. Just kind of representative, we're going to have a video launching up on a Soyuz rocket. We had some visiting vehicles that came to bring us our cargo because that's how we get our food and supplies. Uh, we did five spacewalks while we were up there and just a beautiful picture of the Earth. So thanks for wow. having us. That's incredible. Well, let's hear a little bit more about Charles' mission. All right. Thanks. So welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Joe, this is Mark. I used to be a middle school teacher, so I know it's boring to hear us speak. So we're gonna keep that short so we can get to your questions. And we're gonna start off with a short video. It's about, I don't know, maybe seven, eight minutes that will describe our mission and then we'll get to your questions. So if we're ready, let's roll it. Got good sound too. So that's our crew of three. We launched in a Russian spacecraft and the gentleman in the middle was uh, Sasha Mazurkin, our Soyuz commander. And so here is our launch. We launched from Kazakhstan on a Russian vehicle. It's actually a very smooth ride. And it takes eight and a half minutes to get to space. So you go from zero miles an hour to 17,500 miles an hour in eight minutes. And then we have to catch up to the space station. So we're in space getting to this moment for about six hours. So about six hours after launch, that's us docking with the space station. And it is really tight in that Soyuz. You'll see in a little bit. So it's really nice to get to the space station and meet your buddies up there. There's the three of us again, the, the crew for that. But we joined uh, a crew of three other people to make a crew of six on the space station. And the reason we're up there is to do science in this very unique environment. And that's the reason why we have the International Space Station. We work in physical sciences, looking at how fire reacts in space. We look at the human body. Yep, floating in space is awesome. This is just me trying to make a training video for how to uh, get the bubbles out of an IV. So I grew a lot of uh, plants on the International Space Station. That's going to be important when we start going out to Mars and other planets. They grew great, and they were super tasty. Best Mizuna I have ever eaten. It was good. So we do all types of science. We also do work with students. This is one of the uh, experiments we did uh, with students out of MIT. And Mark, this was your specialty. Yeah, and I got to put together some satellites. And we put those satellites through an airlock to put outside. And then later on, the ground control team was able to deploy those satellites, like you see here. So we actually put those things into orbit from the space station. Yeah, that was pretty cool. And the human body, we're learning a lot more about the human body, even though we've been going to space for a long time. So we take urine samples, blood samples, we can store them in these super cold freezers. And then when we get a chance, we bring those back to Earth so scientists can look at it and help us understand completely how the body reacts in space. Exercise is scheduled for two and a half hours of every day that we're in space because our bodies adapt so well, they also adapt to not needing to work very hard to float. So we have resistive exercise devices, like you see Joe working out on here. It's pretty cool, we get to work out every day for a couple of hours. And then we also have to do cardiovascular, so we run on a treadmill, but you're floating in space, so if you didn't have the bungees and a harness, you would shoot off of the treadmill. So we do that, and we also have a stationary bicycle. We clip in our feet, and then we can go ahead and ride the bike. 
We had lots of vehicles come and visit us at the space station. What you're seeing here is uh, now Northrop Grumman's Cygnus spacecraft launching that brought cargo to the space station. This is SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft. We got to, it gets close to the space station, we reach out using a robotic arm and grab it. So if you like video games, you're gonna be a great astronaut because this is like the most intense video game ever flying the robotic arm, it's pretty fun. But you'd only get one life. <laughs> yeah, so don't mess it up. But this is where we get all of our supplies. This is also where we throw our trash away. So you can imagine keeping all the trash in your house for months at a time, waiting for one of these to come up to throw it all in there and have it burn up as it comes into the atmosphere. During the 168 days that Joe and I were in space, as a team, we did five spacewalks. We call those extravehicular activity or EVAs. And here's a view of one of us coming out of the airlock and then working outside the space station. It's, uh, it's pretty exciting and we're out there anywhere from you know, six to seven hours, so it's a really long day. But when you come out and you look at the Earth 200 miles below you, your heart starts beating a little bit. Yep, a little faster, that's for sure. A lot of the work we did was on um, maintaining or changing major components of that robotic arm I mentioned earlier. And here's a view, I, I think this might be me, changing a high definition camera out on one of the, uh, out there. And you gotta s s uh, feel for how big the space station is when you see a little person outside. And after it's all done, we go back into the doorway there, it's the airlock. We repressurize that after it's sealed up and we can come back inside. And so here we just have a, a minute or so of just some beautiful shots of our planet from space. It is incredible. The deserts of North Africa with the rock of Gibraltar on the left. Of course the moon. You can see how thin the atmosphere is. And then even at night, you have all the lights where people are living so you can see where we all like to hang out. You see lightning flashes. And there's the northern or southern lights from space. It's pretty awesome. And then, before you know it, your five and a half months on, time, on the space station is over. We hand over the uh, kind of the keys to the space station to the crew that was up there and then we get into our really, really, really small Soyuz. It's tight. It is very tight, especially with a lot of cargo we have to bring back with us too. It, it takes up every bit of additional space. But just a few hours later, um, we are going through the atmosphere and that's actually a good thing that we're seeing the heat shields working well as, as it's blading away and melting off. And then hopefully your parachute opens. That's a very good thing. And then you land back in Kazakhstan. You can see it was at the end of February. It was cold, but the Russians did a really, really good job uh, getting there and getting us out of the vehicle. We get out, we hop on a helicopter that takes us to an airplane. Then we hop on the airplane and then we fly back to Houston. So within about 20 hours of being on Earth, we are back home in Houston, Texas. So that was five and a half months in about like six or seven minutes. We know it was quick but we wanted to give you guys time for questions and answers. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Absolutely amazing, amazing stuff. If you guys have questions, you can head over to the microphone. If you're watching on Facebook Live, head down to the comments section and put those questions in and uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can. There's actually a spacewalk going on right now. Yes. Um, what's that like walking outside the vehicle or going outside the vehicle and doing a spacewalk? Go for it, Mark. Well, I, I can tell you, I always enjoyed it. Uh, it. It's a very intense time, though. A lot of the whole team is very focused on making sure it's successful. Um, the view, it's, even, it's hard to describe, but the, we, every time a spacewalk was done, I was extremely happy because there's always something that could go wrong, and every time they were successful, it was a relief. Nice. All right, we've got a question. Go ahead. My question is, when you go to the university, do you have to get, to be an astronaut when you're older, do you have to get a degree? What kind of degree do you need to be an astronaut? Yep, so all astronauts do have a degree. At a minimum, you have to have a bachelor's degree, but it can be in anything science, engineer, or math related. So if you want to become an astronaut, I would say pick whatever you really, really like 
and study really, really hard. I'm a geologist, Mark is a physicist, so we have all kinds of different scientists on the International Space Station. Great question. Thanks. All right, go ahead. Um, my question is, what was your goal to go to space? What was your goal in space? My goal in space was to not mess up. I, uh, that was my biggest fear, was with all the training that we got, all the time and all the dedicated people that tried to make uh, that moment in time happen in space, that if it all rested in my hands, I didn't want to be the one person that would ruin it all. So uh, that was my biggest goal. But we all make mistakes, and believe me, we made a lot of them, uh, but we helped each other out. My goal was, after being together for almost six months, that we didn't hate each other. And I think we did okay. We did great. I like this guy. He's a good, good person. Thanks. Awesome. All right, we've got another question. What happens to your body when you come back down to Earth? Ooh, what's it like when you come back? It feel, it felt, for me, it felt sore. Um, I certainly, my sense of balance was way off. At first, uh, they do a thing called a field test. We uh, had, the hardest part was I had to cross my arms, close my eyes, and walk heel toe, heel, heel toe. And uh, within the first hour or so when I came back from the space station, I couldn't take a step without having to lean on the person next to me. Um, it's different for everybody, though. Everybody's different. For me, the first 24 hours, if I stood up, I wanted to throw up. It was terrible. But it all goes away, and it was totally worth it. All right, we got another question. How big is the space shuttle? So the space shuttle, and I don't know the number, but you can see a picture back here, or a model. The space shuttle was really, really big, but in that big model, people were only at the very top but it was a lot bigger and we would fly more people. We had a crew of seven. The Soyuz, like you saw, it's about this it's big. That and that's so I'd have to it. be like right in here next to them, feet, feet next to each other. You gotta like your buddy, it's yep. small. And then you get to the space station and it's about the size of a five bedroom house. Wow. All right, go ahead. What's your, what's your goal for the planet? What's your favorite planet? No, what's the goal for the planet? Oh, the goal for the planet. So, so where, where next? I, I would say, I, we just went to Italy recently for some public relations events with a crew member of ours who's from Italy. And uh, I thought one of the things he said was really neat. He said that the Earth is gonna be here. That's not a concern. What's a concern is whether or not we're still gonna be on the Earth. So my goal is that we take a, do a really good job of taking care of this precious resource that helps us survive so well in this place that we are uniquely suited for. And hopefully, we'll also be able to explore and get out maybe to Mars. That would be awesome. Awesome. We've got an online question. Um, what, uh, how long is an average mission? And that's from Georgine. So the average mission is right around six months. We were there for 168. I think the crew that's up there now, they'll be there for about 200 days. So somewhere in that 170 to, to 200 days. OK. Go ahead. Do you age slower than you do on Earth? Man, I, I wish, you know, uh, I wouldn't mind slowing down the aging process, but I think it's about the same while we're up there. Might age a little bit more because it's stressful. So yeah, that, that's probably, the stress is probably has a bigger impact, but uh, if you study the theor theory of relativity, um, which I haven't refreshed my knowledge on for a while, there is a change based on how fast you're traveling, but we're not traveling close enough to the speed of light for it to be a significant change. Good question. All right, go ahead. I have a two-part question. One is uh, you both look in very good physical shape, but you also appear to be at the same height and width, a height. Uh, and uh, so are astronauts selected uh, because of those parameters? There is a minimum height and a maximum. We just by chance happen to uh, be this size, so that's just by, uh, by chance. And it depends on the vehicle. I've heard, and I don't quote me on this completely, but it's around, uh, you know, I think the 5'2 range to about 6'4. So there's, oh. there's quite, a, quite a range there. I think and Paolo if, was one of the taller ones. He was oh, yeah. one of the taller. And if you're outside of that range I would, and you want to be an astronaut, don't give up that hope because that changes all the time. It depends on the vehicle, on the spacesuit. So I think for all of you, I would not worry about your physical size if you want to go to space. Okay, and the other question I had is, um, you are exposed to uh, things like cosmic rays in space. Uh, are there any ill effects uh, because of that? 
And how long are you going to be evaluated since you returned? So we will be evaluated for our lifetime. Oh. We'll keep once a year, no, no matter how old we are, we'll come back because we, we get to continue being guinea pigs for science. Um, and the effect on our bodies from that additional, we did get more radiation than a typical human being on the planet. But uh, I think, I don't know, certainly I don't know of anything that's happened to me as a result of that. Um, but you can imagine a lifetime survey of our health is important to figure out if there really is an effect from that. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Good question. Go ahead. Um, what was the biggest mistake you made on the spaceship? Did you make any mistakes? We made, I, you know. I, I made a mistake. I've got a, so I went out and I did a spacewalk, right? It's just like super exciting time. You trained your whole life to go out there. And we have like this safety pack that's on our back in case we get separated, which would be really, really bad. So you don't want to float away. And somehow, I don't know how I did it, but somehow I bumped the controller on my safety pack and it actually started firing. And so I used up all the gas on my safety pack. That's not what you want to go, what you want to do when you do a spacewalk. And so you kind of have to like put that behind you and move on. Um, but mistakes happen all the time and you try to minimize them, but hopefully you learn from your mistakes. So that was one of the big ones in, on my space flight. And I'd reinforce that Joe's response. He was very level headed. We solved the problem and had no problem finishing the spacewalk like it was intended to be fi finished. Um, for me, um, we had a SpaceX Dragon vehicle visiting and uh, it's a very intense time. We had lots of long days, and we were packing that vehicle up to, 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 to separate it from the space station. You can imagine, though, if you're getting ready to open a gap between a spacecraft and the space station, it's really important that the, the hatches between those two spacecraft are tightly sealed, that you don't create a leak in the process. So part of us, this process involves a leak check. And be, we had a, one of the newer folks on the space station, he's a classmate of mine, hadn't been on the space station as long, so I was kind of the, the senior guy in that moment for that particular activity. It was his task to do it. I thought it would help him out, and I actually started connecting the leak detection system to the wrong hatch. So it wouldn't, now the good news is, we had video up there, and the ground was always looking out for us, and before we progressed too far with that, um, they went ahead and mentioned very politely to me, hey, check your hatch. Said, oh, so uh, we uh, went ahead and did the right thing. You mentioned the ground. How important is the ground to your all success in space? They are invaluable. We cannot, we cannot manage the space station solely by the crew on the International Space Station. So we rely on mission control centers around the world. And in fact, the, the uh, ground control team is actively flying the space station. They're the ones that are uh, maintaining the orientation and the particular orbit. We're just being told what tasks we have to do every day. Thank you. All right, got another question? Why does NASA cut the feed when something unexplained comes on the cameras? Uh, you know <laughs> what, that's a, uh, that's a great question. And what I think, uh, so sometimes, so the interesting thing, we're going around the planet and we use satellites to get the video feed um, from the International Space Station back down to the ground. So while I think you might hope that there's like some weird conspiracy going on that we're cutting the feed. But when we lose the feed and it happens during spacewalks, it happens when we're talking to our families, it's because we lost communication with that, uh, that satellite, so sorry. And I can tell you it happened a lot when I was talking to my wife on the phone. Believe me, there was nothing about our conversation that was interesting enough for someone to purposely shut it off. <laughs> it was just, uh, we would, this, the antennas would be pointing towards the satellite and maybe the space station is so big that something would get in the way and we'd lose the ability to talk for a while. Okay. Next question. Um, do you guys know like the plans for what you're going to do when we're like closer to running out of fossil fuels for ships, the rocket ships? Wow, I don't. I, I mean, that's a very good question. Um, but we use liquid oxygen and liquid LH2, liquid yep. hydrogen, um, I don't think those are fossil fuels. Oh. Okay. So really, we're in a good situation to continue uh, without using fossil fuels. Okay. Go ahead. What inspired you to be one. an astronaut? I'm sorry, I repeat that when we missed it. What inspired you to be an astronaut? What made you guys want to become astronauts? Well, I'm old, as you can tell. I'm old. And, and he's older, which is good. <laughs> um, but when I was young, the astronauts were 
kind of getting done, walking on the moon and all that. And so my grandfather, he actually had this stuff called film. It's like really old. And we would watch these movies. And we were watching movies of the astronauts walking on the moon. And that was kind of the first thing that inspired me. And I really like to read science fiction. So I read about people going to all these different planets. So I think between those two, that was kind of my motivation to become an astronaut. I like science fiction a lot, too. I really like the idea of being able to explore, push the limits, and maybe get a different perspective on what it means to be human and how we fit into the big picture, where we fit in the universe, and things like that. Cool. Thanks. Go ahead. How do you guys change when um, everything just floats around? Like change your clothes? Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it can be a little bit challenging because, you know, your feet aren't there. But one thing we do is we always have these, they call them handrails, but really our feet are kind of hooked underneath them. And so sometimes, you know, you just, you take your shirt off, it floats around. Um, taking your pants off and putting them on can be a little bit of a challenge because you got to take your feet off of the handrail. But you can imagine just kind of floating and, you know, you're like in the middle of this room and you want to take your pants off. You can do it, right? The difference is <laughs> if the pants float away. So when I first got up there, the hard thing for me was I wasn't really good at hooking my feet under things. So even though eventually it becomes instinctual, I would, I would be changing my clothes, but I'd be, bump, I'd be floating around, free floating, and bumping into things the whole time. And the other thing that's important is we have bungee cords all over the place in the place we would use to change our clothes. So I'd take off a sock. I'd have to make it really good about making sure I put the sock underneath the bungee cord. Otherwise, I'd never find the sock again. But you can put your pants on two legs at a time. You can, you can. put them on two legs. <laughs> oh, yes. So that is something space. different. Yes. <laughs> all right, go ahead. When something goes wrong in space, what are your options of getting out of that problem? Yeah, we do a lot of emergency training in case we have a fire, in case something hits the space station and we lose the pressure inside. Uh, we train in case somebody gets sick. Um, so depending on what the problem is, we try to uh, you know, address the problem right away. But we always have our Soyuz spaceship with us. It's always on the space station. So if something really, really bad happens, we can get in that spaceship and come back home. And the three big emergencies that we train a lot for are uh, a fire, a toxic atmosphere inside the space station, and uh, depressurization. So if something hits the space station, it makes a hole, and we start losing the atmosphere. You've done some work with fire in space, and it doesn't behave like it does on Earth. Fire does it? doesn't behave the same, um, and we try to use material that's not going to continue to burn. Uh, but we do have ways, whether it's uh, with CO2 or with water, to try to put out a fire if it happens. Cool. All right, next question. Thanks. What was the best part of being in space? I th the, for me, the best part of being in space was the view. I, it's, it's, uh, we take amazing pictures from space, but it really doesn't do it justice. It is the most incredible thing. It's cool. I like floating. <laughs> I feel like Superman. I'm just... <laughs> Actually, on that, along those lines, I really liked flying through the space station really fast in this direction, grabbing, grabbing a handrail in a corner, and letting my feet swing around and changing directions. That was fun for me. Yeah, it's fun. Backflips were nice, too. You guys really get a chance to see Newton's laws in action. Absolutely. That's they work. All. They do work. All right, go ahead. Is there any um, psychological effects? Uh, I would say the psychological effects would be more associated with being separated from the rest of humanity than being, having to float. But I like being away from people, so I was in a happy spot. <laughs> it was good. Yeah, I think we're still sane. Yeah, we're still sane. I, I'm as pretty much sure as we can be. Serious enough to require attention. <laughs> All right, go ahead. What happened to the rest of your crew? So <laughs> what happened to the rest of them? They're still alive. Everybody's good. Um, so we had three that came back down while we stayed up there. And so actually, we all met together in uh, Italy last week. So we were giving talks together. Uh, our commander, Sasha, is a Russian. So he's over there in Russia right now. And then the three people that, when we came home, they stayed on the space station. They just landed about a week or so ago. So they're back on Earth. So we're all going to get together here in about In August, month. yep. Nice. Go ahead. How long does it take to get to the moon? So historically, it was a two, or two to three day trip, yep. all right? So it'd be a couple days to get there. So it's not too far away. What Mars will be a lot longer. Yeah, what happens when they go to Mars? Mars, now we're talking six to nine months to get there. Thanks. Good question. Go ahead. Uh, since there's no sound in space, how do you communicate? 
Ooh, with, good question. So radio waves, I love this. Physics, here we go. So, <laughs> Keep it short. I'll, I'll, really? Keep it short. So radio waves, x-rays, visible light, they're all different frequencies of light. So the same way we can see, um, the same way we can see light from the sun, even though it goes through a vacuum, because those rays, those waves travel through a vacuum, radio waves travel through a vacuum. And we, on our spacesuits, when we're doing a spacewalk, we can communicate with each other and the ground because we have antennas and radios that transmit radio waves and we receive them and transmit. That's a great question. Go ahead. Do you bring animals on to the International Space Station? Do we breed animals? Do we bring animals? Bring animals. Uh, yeah. We didn't bring any with, in our Soyuz spacecraft. Uh, Joe, actually, I'd say he, oh, yeah, we brought Joe. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> no, it's cold, man. But, but there were, there were uh, animals on the space station with us. We, they didn't come with us. They came in some of those cargo spacecraft. What are your spacesuits made out of? Man, I don't know exactly the... I know Vectran and RTV. Yeah, so, <laughs> I, well, I don't know the exact materials. If you look at the spacesuit that we use to do a spacewalk, there's a lot of different layers that have different purposes, so it's not just one material. Uh, there's got to be at least, I don't know, it's close to five to ten different types of materials that are all lined up. Some of it's to protect us from the change in temperature while we're out there, and some of that is to protect us just from physical things that are there. So it's, uh, it's pretty complicated. It's not like this. And the reason I mentioned Vectran and RTV is when we're doing spacewalks, we have to check our gloves because as we're moving around the space station, we might come across a sharp object. And if it cut, the, cut that, we need to report that to the ground because that could be a problem for us continuing the spacewalk. Okay. We've got a Facebook question. How do you deal with medical health in space? All right, so we get basic training in all types of medical stuff. You know, or we're not doctors, although we did have some doctors up there with us. So we can take care of most first aid stuff. Uh, you know, if we get a cut, um, you know, if you something just, in my eye, for example, something that in your eye. So we can handle most of that. If it gets more than we can handle, we can always talk to a doctor that's in mission control, and they could talk us through a lot of procedures. We have ultrasounds. We could do all kinds of things for them to figure out what the problem is. But just like an emergency, if it's really, really bad, let's say you had an appendix that was getting ready to blow up on you, we could hop in our Soyuz and we could be back on Earth pretty quickly. And every day there's an orbit in which we can land somewhere where we could get medical help. Well, let's give Mark and Joe a big round of applause for joining us today. Thank you guys so much. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Boeing, for bringing you this show today. And uh, thanks for watching. Thank you. Thanks. That was awesome.